Hello and welcome to this week's lecture for how to do things with words. Sorry to be getting this one to you a little bit late. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we're doing interviews right now for an open position in philosophy. And uh, last week and the beginning of this week have been a little uh, trying in terms of the amount of interviews we've had scheduled. But things are opening up now and I should uh, be able to get you these lectures out more quickly for future weeks. So this week, we're looking at the notion of speech acts. So just to remind you where we are from last week, last week we were talking about uh, Paul Grice's notion of, um, of intentional communication, right? So we started this class out with the question of what makes it the case that some symbol means some particular thing or other? And we thought about some different features that could factor into that. So we thought about, well, maybe it's something to do with conventions that exist between people. Maybe it's something to do with, um, with uh, uh, the, um, you know, this kind of co-occurrence, this kind of causal relationship between the thing that is signified like a tree and the word tree. And then we saw Grice's answer, which is uh, specifically that what makes the case that um, someone or that some utterance means a particular thing is that someone means something by that utterance and what specifically it amounts to to mean something by an utterance is to have this kind of complicated structure of intentional uh, aim so so for some utterance to mean a particular thing then someone must have meant to affect some uh, change in an audience um, or some uh, response in an audience by means of that utterance. Um, people, uh, the audience should have uh, been, a, should have recognized that the person intended that uh, to affect that change in them by means of this utterance. And then because the person recognized it, that should actually cause the change to occur. And in your discussion groups on Friday, we talked about a lot of different examples related to this, like why are these different conditions important? Well, it seems like if someone, if something just causes someone to think a certain thing, so if we think about the case where the student left the paper underneath some other letters, that may cause me to think the paper came in on time. But it's not because I recognize his intention there. Um, and, and for that reason, it doesn't seem like he's communicating to me uh, some particular state. There's this more of this kind of brute causal effect that occurs there. There's some kind of symbol or some kind of thing in the environment that just causes me to think a certain way, but it doesn't have kind of the reciprocity that Grice and others have thought is necessary for communication. Now, there are certain shortcomings for this view. We talked a little bit about those as well. So for one example, how does Grice make sense of the idea that some word, when it's not pronounced by someone with any intended goal, how does he make sense that that word on paper means a particular thing, right? Think about the word things here and how to do things with words, which you're staring out right now, right? No one right now is intending to affect a certain change in an audience by means of that. Well, we might think, okay, when this book was published, the publisher certainly intended to affect a change in an audience. So maybe that kind of active intending is far away in the past. And that actually might fit Grice's view. Alternatively, what about someone just thinking words themselves or speaking to themselves in soliloquy? There's no audience there. Well, we talked about some ways that Grice might try to get around this. Um, so for example, he might say this utterance has that meaning because it is the sort of, or, or this word has that meaning because it's the sort of word that someone would use if they were intending to produce a certain effect. And so I think it's interesting to think about those kinds of shortcomings of the Gricean view. Uh, certainly there have been a lot of work published on that notion. Um, and uh, that's something that can be investigated further. But for our purposes right now, it's just important to see this kind of intentional structure that Grice is relying upon uh, in communication. And, and it does seem like there is some truth around this that like getting ideas across from, person, from one person to another person is it sort of at the heart of communication. Okay, so um, now we turn to uh, a related topic, which is the topic of speech acts. So um, if we think about this account of communication that Grice is putting forward, really what's at the, the cornerstone or the foundational stone of that kind of picture is this idea that um, someone is performing a certain act, right? That they are, that they are intending 
to do a certain thing, intending to affect a response in their audience. So um, it seems like really at the, at the heart of Grice's view is this idea of people doing things in speaking. And this is a kind of theme that will continue with Austin. So, um, but, but with Austin, the, the, the focus here is a little bit different. And I think we can get a sense of this by looking at just the first paragraph of Austin's paper uh, or Austin's um, lecture. By the way, I meant to uh, mention that uh, this book, How to Do Things with Words, is a collection of uh, lectures, 12 lectures that Austin gave over the course of several days at Harvard University in 1955. So the William James lectures are this prestigious series of lectures at Harvard. Um, the American philosopher and psychologist William James uh, was a Harvard professor, and these uh, lectures are named after him. And you'll often find that that very many of the most or, or very many influential works in philosophy are pulled from this lecture series. So I actually believe that uh, Saul Kripp Kripke's Naming and Necessity is also from this lecture series. There are others as well that are very important, very important works of 20th century philosophy. So this is one of those important um, lecture series. So th these were delivered in 1955. They weren't published until actually after Austin's death. Austin died um, very young from cancer. Um, he was a, a professor at Oxford. He was part of this like real uh, movement of, uh, or this real um, influential school of philosophy in Oxford in the middle of the 20th century. It includes uh, others such as um, Ryle and, um, and Grice was a, a member of this kind of a school of thought. Strawson is another a uh, very important member of this uh, school. So all of these people are um, uh, this kind of like Oxford, uh, or I mean, sometimes it's referred to as Cambridge and Oxford together. Um, uh, um, sometimes under the title Oxbridge, actually combining those two. Um, but this 20th century uh, school of philosophers in, in England um, really initiated this kind of change in philosophy um, that's sometimes referred to as the linguistic turn. So the linguistic turn is this uh, change in philosophy that happened in the 20th century where uh, philosophers began to really address a lot of their central questions by looking carefully at the way in which we use language and using that as a window into these questions. And, and so um, we might talk about that later on, but it's an interesting historical moment in 20th century philosophy of which Austin is a part. Okay, so let's look at the first paragraph of this. So as I was saying, um, Austin, like Grice, is interested in um, the acts we perform in speaking. And this will be a central kind of theme in this class, a central concept in this class, the idea of a speech act. But whereas um, Grice is interested in really communication, like me um, getting an idea across to you, Austin's interest in speech acts is much broader than that. And we're gonna be thinking about that today. So I wanna look at the first paragraph here and, and just as a way into thinking about this distinction. So Grice or Austin writes, um, what I shall have to say here is neither difficult nor contentious. The only merit I shall like to claim for it is that of being true, right? So this is the way things are, at least in part. So the phenomenon to be discussed is very widespread and obvious, and it cannot fail to have already been noticed at least here and there by others, yet I have not found attention paid to it specifically. I was for too long, it was for too long the assumption of philosophers that the business of a statement can only be to describe some state of affairs um, or to state some fact which it must do either truly or falsely. Grammarians indeed have regularly pointed out that not all sentences are used in making statements. Um, there are traditionally besides grammarians uh, besides grammarian statements, also questions and exclamations and sentences expressing commands or wishes or concessions. And doubtless, philosophers have not intended to deny this, despite some loose use of sentence for statement. Doubtless, too, both grammarians and philosophers have been aware that it is by no means easy to distinguish even questions, commands, and so on from statements by means of the few and jejun grammatical marks available such as word order, mood, and the like. Though perhaps it has not been used to dwell on the difficulties uh, which this fact obviously raises. For how do we decide which is which? What are the limits and definitions of each? So what is Austin doing here? Well, he's noticing that within uh, philosophy, 
uh, we have had this tendency, philosophy, and you know, he's um, writing right around the advent of linguistics as a kind of science of language. So he's not really talking specifically about uh, linguistics specifically, but linguistics grows out of philosophy. So, so that would be uh, totally relevant here as well. So we have this idea of sentences. And for a long time, we thought that the work of sentences was to state the facts, right? So what do we use sentences for? We use them to convey information. That is really essential to sentences. So this was a traditional view. But in fact, Austin thinks, no, that um, that's not true. Sentences are not merely statements. Statements might state the facts, um, but that's only one class of sentences or of utterances. That's only one class of um, things that um, our utterances can do. And there's a lot of other stuff over here that our statements can also do. So right off the bat, Austin is interested in the way in which we use language to do things. He thinks we've paid too much attention to instances in which utterance are used to state the fact. And instead, we need to turn our attention to the other things that utterances can do. And this is a major uh, departure uh, on Austin's part and something that's going to be um, at really the cornerstone of our discussion for this week. So the idea of speech acts as used to do other things than simply state the facts. Now, it's certainly true that we can use utterances to state the facts, and that's one thing that utterances do. So I can assert by means of an utterance. An assertion is a statement of the facts. Um, but I can also do other things as well, and that's what Grice is interested in. Or that's, sorry, that's what Austin is interested in. So he's interested in the ways in which we use language to make promises, to express our intentions, to, um, to uh, make new obligations, to marry people, and so on. So let's turn to the handout here. All right, so I start out this handout um, by talking about um, some of the philosophers who have assumed that picture I was just criticizing, that Austin is criticizing, of language. So I think here you can see Locke, Mill, and Russell, all to varying degrees, talking about uh, statements as, uh, or sentences, um, or language in general, as indicating facts or, or carrying information, right? So Russell says, language um, serves three purposes. One, to indicate facts. Two, to express the state of the speaker. And three, to alter the state of here. I'm just going to pick on Russell here. You can look at the others for yourself. But um, Russell, uh, in this instance, is, is really narrowing down the scope of what sentences can do. Now, it's true here that he does say that they conserve the intention of altering the state of hearers. And that's something that, that Austin is interested in, but he's missing this whole class of utterances or this whole class of speech acts that Austin and Searle are very interested in. And those are illocutionary acts or acts of just bringing about changes in the world by speaking as we speak, even if they don't change a state of a hearer. Okay. Um, now, in this first chapter of Austin, you'll see that there are some other categories of um, utterances that people have picked out, right? Um, so uh, I'm going to use this to talk about these, right? So there are two um, kinds of utterances in Austin's view, and he lays this out very clearly in chapter one. So just have this in the back of your mind as re you're reading over that. So um, he thinks that there, essentially, there's kind of a foundational, um, you can also do this in terms of a tree diagram, a, a, a foundational distinction between utterances such that they are constatives, they might be constatives, or they might be non-constative. Okay, it's a little, running out of a little room here. So with constative utterances, what these things do is they all have the aim of stating a fact, okay? So they have the structure of a sentence that will state a fact, but um, some of them fail to do so, okay? So some of them, right? So the ones that actually achieve or, um, or uh, um, that are members of this constative class that actually do end up stating facts, he will call constatives proper. Right, so constative sentences are sentences that intend to state the facts and actually do end up stating something true about the way the world is. Um, 
but there are also instances of nonsense. Okay. So what does this word what does this word mean? Nonsense. Well, it's made up of two um, roots here. So a sense is essentially like a sense you would find in the dictionary. So if you look up a word in the dictionary, um, sometimes there's just one sense that it's defined in terms of, but sometimes there are multiple senses. So if you look up a word, you can see entry one, entry two, entry three. An example I've used before is the idea of a bank, right? So with the word bank, you might, for example, find entry one, a financial institution. Entry two, the side of a river, okay? So those are different senses for the word bank, right? Bank can mean a uh, financial institution or bank can mean side of the river, right? Those are both senses of this word, okay? So senses are in a sense meanings, but if we have nonsense, then nonsense doesn't mean anything, right? So think about the sentence, Furious green ideas sleep idly. Okay, I believe that's it. This is an example from um, Chomsky from uh, some time ago. To, um, uh, Noam Chomsky, the famous linguist and political uh, theorist in some sense. Um, so he says uh, the sentence, okay, here's a nonsensical uh, sense it, sentence. Furious green ideas sleep furiously or something like that. So. Um, that sentence, we can describe those as word salad sentences, sentences that look like they have the structure of a constative but don't actually mean anything, okay? So those are still sort of in this one class of sentences. And then on the idea of non-constative language, there uh, might be various things that, um, that uh, are non-constative. So if we think about Russell's comment here, he says, there are utterances that express the state of the hearer. So in talking about that, what Austin is talking about are affective language, right? So if you think about a word like ouch, the main function of that word is to express the feeling of the speaker, the person who speaks it. But then there's also this other class, and this is a class that is of primary, primary interest to Austin, is the class of the performative utterances. And these utterances aren't there primarily to state some fact about the world or to express the speaker's internal attitude. Instead, the main point of these utterances is to do a particular thing, to perform an action. So performative utterances or performative sentences, and it starts out Austin is trying to draw a distinction between kinds of sentences, performative sentences exist not primarily to express some state of the hearer or not to state some fact of the world. They're not in the business of stating how things are. Their main role is to do a particular thing, to, to change the world in some way, okay? Um, and, and this is the main interest of what we're looking at this week. So these, um, starting out, we're gonna talk, think about them as a class of sentences, performative sentences, but quickly we're gonna move away from that and start talking about these as though they're a kind of action someone might perform in an instance of speaking, right? So here's some examples of performative sentences in this first um, uh, way in which Austin speaks about them, right? Um, so um, I might, uh, for example, um, marry someone. So I might say I do in a wedding ceremony, right? might say I do in a wedding ceremony. What is the main part of that? It's not primarily to state some fact about me as a person to tell you that I am doing a particular thing. Rather the point of that is to engage in a marriage to this person, right? I may say, um, I, I, may say um, I uh, promise to pay you back next week. If I uh, promise, this will be a, a, an account that weighs heavily for Searle in a little, the second article you're looking at this week. If I say a promise, the main point of that is not to express my intention to pay you back, but to make a kind of obligation between you and me such that I have to pay you back, right? Uh, another example, a judge may say, I pronounce the, um, I pronounce the criminal guilty, right? Now, certainly the judge um, intends to um, have the, the criminal punished in this case, but also that act of pronouncing guilt is an act of judgment. And doing that 
the uh, judge is judging that this person is guilty. So they're performing an act of casting a judgment, uh, of, of making this person not merely a defendant, but in fact, a criminal. So they're changing that status of that person. Okay, so all of these are instances where the main point of the utterance is not merely to state some fact about the world. The judge isn't saying, um, I discover that this person is guilty. They are in some sense making a judgment of that. They're changing the way the world is. Okay, so that's the main idea behind a performative utterance. Austin has an, article, or an argument in the second half of chapter one um, where he talks about um, the way in which saying things can make it so. And um, he wants to explain, um, first of all, he wants to argue uh, against an idea that says promising is the outward report of an internal obligation. And I think that argument's very interesting. So I uh, suggest, you know, look at that and let's talk a little bit about it to get clearer on it. But additionally, Austin does think that it's not only the case that saying some words makes it true that I am married or makes it true that I have an obligation or makes it true that this person is guilty. Instead, he thinks that um, he thinks that saying the words is not necessary. So you could, for example, marry someone by jumping over a broom in some traditions, right? Um, or so, so it seems like to marry, it's not necessary that you say something. Um, no, um, nor is it sufficient. There need to be background conditions that hold in order to make it the case that this utterance um, does um, perform this action. So, right, like if I say, I do, as I'm standing in line at the sa sandwich counter to uh, the person who's serving me, I don't thereby marry that person, right? There have to be other conditions that hold. So Austin thinks that, um, that it's not the case that the say, saying the thing is enough by itself. Instead, saying this thing has to exist in a certain conventional um, space, right? There have to be certain rules that are in place that my utterance works with to change the world to make it the case that now this new state of affairs exists. So Austin's second chapter, which you'll also read, is aimed at fleshing out what these rules are, right? So Austin um, says, okay, with a performative utterance, so if we talk about a constat of utterance, an utterance that aims to state the fact, we praise that utterance by saying it's true and we denigrate it by saying it's false or, or we um, you know, judge it poorly by saying that it's false. But constat of utterances, since they're not in the business or performative utterances, since they're not in the business of stating facts, that true and false language won't apply to them. So instead, what we can say is that the performance was brought off happily or unhappily. And in the second chapter, I'm not going to go into these in detail, Austin lays out a variety of ways in which an utterance, uh, an intended performative utterance, can be unhappy, can not either not totally achieve its goals, um, or else um, uh, uh, if it does, it does achieve the goal, the performance is in some way botched. And so there are six different infelicities that Austin lays out. Um, I encourage you to look at these. Um, and uh, he thinks that this is basically, so basically what Austin is doing here is, he's saying, okay, these utterances can actually perform actions, but they don't do it all by themselves. They can only do it with this kind of normative or conventional structure existing around them. I do can only marry people if there are certain practices in place and there are certain uh, traditions and systems that make that serve that function in this instance. And if those background conditions aren't satisfied, then maybe the performance of marriage is flawed in some way. Okay, so chapter two lays out these various felicities, um, and I encourage you to look at that in some more detail. Now, what happens with this stuff that Austin lays out? So Austin is very interested initially in laying out these two classes of sentences, performatives and constatives. But ultimately, he thinks that we're not going to be able to ma maintain this as two classes of sentences, because sometimes sentences seem to both state a fact and do a thing, right? So I might say that Rottweiler hasn't been fed in four days, right? And in saying this, I may intend to tell you that something is the case, 
And I may also intend you to, to warn you to not go near that Rottweiler or that lion. I think I used lion in the example uh, for you guys in the handout, right? So later on, Austin abandons this early notion of two kinds of sentences or two kinds of utterances. And instead, he starts suggesting that in a single speech act, we may perform three kinds, we, we may perform all these kinds of, uh, of um, acts in speaking as we do, right? So it may be the case that in saying uh, that lion is hungry, I actually intend to inform you of something, to per so to perform what Austin ends up calling a locutionary act, of act and what Searle will call a propositional act, the act of stating an idea or causing you to think that some proposition holds or some statement holds. We'll talk a little bit about more about proposition when I meet with you on Friday, just so we can get a little bit clearer on that. But um, I may perform this kind of locutionary act, as Austin calls it, the act of saying something. And that would include things like making some sounds, right? So in um, speaking, I perform an act of making some sounds. Like if I say that lion hasn't eaten in four days, I produce sounds. But I would also produce sounds if I went, blah, 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 right? So it's not that producing, I mean, producing sounds is one act I perform, but I also state some words in saying that lion hasn't been fed in four days. And that's different than just making the contentless uh, noises I did a moment ago. And I may also uh, state some fact about the world. So all of these things are gonna be locutionary acts, acts of uh, saying something uh, by means of my utterance. And, and these sort of stand in for what we got for constative. So, so amongst those kinds of acts of saying something are acts of stating true propositions, okay? So our constative, our constative sentences have reduced to locutionary actions at this point. Um, at the same time, I may intend, I'm gonna switch over to the homework, Searle, what is a speech act? Oh, here it is. Um, I may at the same time intend to produce some feelings in you, my audience, as speaking as I do, right? So if I say that lion hasn't been fed in four days, I may intend for you to avoid that lion. Like I wanna get you to do something, right? Or if I tell a joke, I may intend to get you to laugh. Or if I, um, if I express my grievances, I may intend for you to, to, to empathize with me, right? So there are these various kinds of acts we perform in speaking where we want to change what another person is doing, right? To change another person's state. Austin ends up calling those performative acts and they don't actually line up very well with the uh, constative, I'm sorry, not performative, perlocutionary acts. Those don't end up lining very well with either constatives or performatives. They're this new kind of thing, this act of doing something to another person. And then what really corresponds to the performative acts that we had before are these kind of illocutionary acts, right? So I can issue a warning without you heeding it, right? And so issuing a warning is me doing something by means of my word. So if I say, that lion hasn't eaten in four days, I'm issuing a warning to you. Maybe you still walk in there and pet the lion or whatever, that would be very unwise. You don't heed my warning. So in a certain sense, I have achieved some of my goals. I've, I've issued a warning, but I haven't achieved uh, the goal of warning you, of causing you to stay away from that lion, right? Um, similarly, when the judge says, I pronounce you guilty, uh, they perform an illocutionary act, an illocutionary act of passing sentence. If I say I do, I um, perform the illocutionary act of committing or in, indulging in a marriage, as Austin says. So there are these, we end up having these three classes of speech acts, locutionary acts, which are just acts of expressing, of saying things, including acts of expressing ideas. Searle will call those acts of expressing a definitive idea, a propositional act. And again, we'll talk about that. Then we have illocutionary acts, which are these acts of doing uh, additional things in speaking as we speak. So marrying someone, um, pronouncing judgment and so on. And then ultimately we have these perlocutionary acts, which are acts of changing someone else's uh, state in some way of affecting an audience. So 
if you read ahead in Austin, you can, you know, especially chapter seven, eight, nine, and 12, I think are very influential in this. You can learn more about this stuff, but that's not part of your assignment. Instead, what you need to do for your group work, sorry, your homework too is directed at Austin. So you'll be thinking about these notions that Austin's laying out in your homework, which is due this evening at 1159. But for your group work, you should read Searle's article in advance. And he is really laying out explaining this third kind of act, these illocutionary acts. I set this up on your group work. So read the group work handout carefully. And he wants to explain what the kinds of background rules and conventions as a culture are that allow us to perform these illocutionary acts. So there's this natural bridge between Austin and Searle. Austin lays out these kind of infelicities, these conditions that make the utterance go happily. And Searle is working in the same camp. So both Austin and Searles are, both Austin and Searle are what are called conventionalist about speech acts. So they think the fact that we're able to perform these speech acts is because we have these kinds of cultural milieus that have created within our language, these rules for doing things. And so as you read Searle and as you discuss in your group work, I want you to think about how he's laying out those rules to explain how we can perform speech acts, okay? Illocutionary acts are his specific focus here. So I hope that's helpful. Um, you'll work on this further in your group work on Wednesday. And then in Friday, on Friday and Thursday, well, Friday just this week, because we don't have any in-person meetings yet. We'll all talk about this in discussion with me. In working through your material this week, you should be coming up with concrete questions to ask me on Friday. That's how you're gonna uh, earn those performance or those, um, those participation points. So I want to encourage you to think about that. I look forward to hearing about your group work tomorrow and I look forward to talking with you uh, later in the week uh, and answering your questions related to this material on this very interesting topic of speech acts. Thank you and have a nice day.